Welcome to the Veritas Forum, engaging university students and faculty in discussions about life's hardest questions and the relevance of Jesus Christ to all of life. Well, good evening all. It's uh, great to be with you. We've got a rock... British accent, yeah, okay. You ever heard those, you know, Downton Abbey or whatever? Okay. Can't quite speak like that. <clears throat> so tonight, what we're going to be looking at is uh, we've got a rather a bit of a dichotomy on the title, uh, which is uh, History or Hoax. That's a title just in order to get you in. What we're going to be looking at is uh, the evidence there is for the Gospels and the beginnings of Christianity. Now, of course, many people will be quite skeptical about what Christians say about the origins of Christianity. So I want us to begin by looking at some non-Christian sources about the origins of Christianity, just to help us get our bearings. And here we have a figure called Tacitus, Cornelius Tacitus, who wrote about the great fire in Rome in the year 64. Uh, Tacitus was a young child at the time in Rome, but Tacitus often is trusted when he writes about things that happened in such far-flung places as Britain uh, well before he was born. So here are his words about what happened at the Great Fire in Rome when it was suspected that Nero, the emperor, had started the fire. But neither help bought by humans, nor generous gifts from the emperor, nor all the ways of placating heaven could stifle the scandal or dispel the belief that the fire had taken place by order. That's order of Nero. Therefore, to scotch the rumour, Nero substituted as culprits and punished with the utmost refinements of cruelty a class of men, or people, whatever it says, class of men, loathed for their vices, whom the crowd called Christians. Now here we have the word Christian being used by a non-Christian, and Christian we can analyse as a word. It presupposes a word like Christ, which is a Greek and Latin word, which goes back to the Hebrew word Messiah. So when you have a group of people called Christians, they're a group, presumably, who think that the Jewish expected Messiah has come. So in other words, we can derive a certain amount of the belief of this group from their name. Christian, of course, was first used as outsider language. In other words, it's not that Christians called themselves Christians. It was actually an insult, just as the word Methodist was first outsider language before Methodists then adopted it for themselves. Same with Quaker. So what we have here is a, a mention of the word Christian. And then he continues, Christus, the founder of the name, had undergone the death penalty in the reign of Tiberius. Tiberius was emperor from the year 14 through to the year 37. And this happened by the sentence of the procurator Pontius Pilate. He's, of course, mentioned in the New Testament documents uh, in, uh, in the Gospels. And he was uh, governor of Judea from the year 26 to the year 36. And the pernicious superstition was checked for a moment, only to break out uh, once more, not merely in Judea, the home of the disease, but in the capital, that's Rome itself, where all things horrible and shameful in the world collect and become fashionable. So uh, don't visit there. Um, <clears throat> but the point is uh, here that uh, Tastus is no particular friend of these Christians, but he does confirm some things about the origins of Christianity. Firstly, the geographical origins, that it began in Judea, and that it had now spread to Rome by uh, uh, the year 64. He continues, first then, the confessed members of the sect were arrested. Next on their disclosures, vast numbers were convicted, not so much on the count of arson as for hatred of the human race. That's one of the things we know about uh, Christians. They hate people. And uh, there we have it here. Um, <clears throat> and origin accompanied their end. They were covered with wild beast skins and torn to death by dogs, uh, or they were fastened on crosses, and when daylight failed, were burned to serve as lamps by night. So there we are. Uh, no doubt with a carbon footprint. But the point is here uh, that it was very difficult for people being Christians in Rome at the time. And we know something about the geographical origins of Christianity. We know that it begins sometime between the year 26 and the year 36. And here it spread 1,500 or so miles in those 30 or so years. Now, the fact that people are willing to die for something does not, of course, show that it's true. People die for all sorts of ideological systems. But it does at least attest to their sincerity, that they believed uh, sincerely in uh, the Christian system. And I find it difficult to go along with some of those reconstructions of early Christianity, which have most of the Christian belief really invented 
40, 50, 60 years after Christianity began, because I find it very difficult to see exactly how it spread without some really substantial message there at the beginning, uh, the sort of thing that people are willing to die for. So that's what I'd want to uh, draw from that, the large numbers of people there were Christians. There are other sources, which are non-Christian sources, which uh, talk about the origins of Christianity. One of them is a very interesting source by Pliny. Pliny was governor of northwest Turkey around the year 112. He wrote to the emperor asking for advice on the, from the emperor as to how to deal with Christians. And he has a number of tests for whether people are Christians, and one of the key tests is are they prepared to worship Roman gods? The whole test, of course, presupposes that these people aren't just prepared to worship other deities because they have followed the basic Jewish tradition and understanding that you don't worship anyone but God alone. But then in that same correspondence, he talks about them describing a meeting that they're having as singing to Christ and treating him as a god or God, which is rather striking because it means, of course, that somehow these people have come to identify Jesus Christ as the Jewish God. Some people have the view that gradually over time, people had more and more exalted conceptions of Jesus. So at first, they thought he was a very special man. Then they thought he was a very, very special man. Then they thought he was a very, very, very special man. Then maybe halfway to God and eventually three quarters of the way and then all the way to God. Now, <clears throat> uh, and, and this just sort of happens over time. You get gradually more and more exalted views. And there are some serious scholars who view that. Now, one of the pro uh, problems I, I have with that is the mathematical problem. When you ask yourself the question, how many gods do Jews believe in, the normal answer to that question is one. When you ask the question, how many gods do Greeks and Romans believe in, the normal answer to that is many. Because, of course, Zeus can look down from the sky, see a pretty maid, get together with her, and they can produce another half-god. You see, you know, Percy Jackson style. It's the sort of thing that can happen. <laughs> so the point is that the number of gods can just sort of keep going up. So you've got one mathematical rule for uh, gods in Judaism, that the, the, the number uh, has to be one. Uh, and then uh, in uh, Roman religion, you can have many. Now, the difficulty, of course, is if Christianity begins in the cradle of Judaism, where you only have one god, can you ever go through a stage of like having one and a half? Um, that's the basic problem, that it can violate that mathematical rule, that if you have a, a very strict divide between uh, God who made all things and everything that was made, uh, for instance, then it doesn't really work very easily. So the sort of thing we can see from early uh, sources are the spread of Christianity uh, going far and fast, and the basic accord we have between the non-Christian documents and the Christian writings about difficulties that were sometimes encountered, not always encountered, but sometimes encountered by Christians in being Christians. Now, let's go on to some Christian writings. Now, you might say, oh, I'm not prepared to trust those, but let's think about it. Of course, most of the writings about early Christianity are by Christians, just as most of the writings about golf are by people interested in golf. That's just the nature of life. I mean, most things are written by people interested in things. And you can't just say, I'm not going to consider them because they're written by biased people. Because bias doesn't mean you shouldn't be considered. For instance, if I said, and I was examining someone for a doctoral uh, thesis, and I said to them, I'm not going to um, uh, agree to award you this degree because you are biased. You want your thesis to be right. That doesn't really help. Or, or, or if, so, if you were accused of something very terrible uh, and uh, uh, you try and defend yourself, someone could say, but you're biased. You want to show yourself innocent, uh, and so on. Bias isn't a reason for not listening. So of course we have Christian documents, and of course they have an interest in Christianity. One of the striking things about the Gospels, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that I hope you will, as educated people, take the time to read at some stage, it really doesn't take very long, uh, is that you can find all sorts of knowledge they have of the time and place of the origins of Christianity. Now, this is very striking because there's an unusual case of scholarly consensus. When you ask most scholars where Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John originated, most of them, whether they are sceptical scholars or less sceptical scholars, people who go for traditional attributions or not, will basically say that three or four of the Gospels were written outside the land where the events originated. They disagree about which one might have been in the land, but they basically agree that a lot of the material was written down somewhere else. And yet they so show striking knowledge of the time and place, as I hope to show. Let's look at the uh, question of knowing people's names.
Names are, of course, rather hard to remember, but uh, we'll think about that in a minute. There has been a study done by a German uh, scholar called Tal Ilan who's gathered together a number of different names uh, that are written on bone boxes or in historical records like Josephus, Dead Sea Scrolls, and so on. By the way, um, our moderator tonight has photographed more of the Dead Sea Scrolls than anyone else alive and has done many other wonderful things as well. Um, uh, but uh, so uh, it's great to, to be uh, with Professor Zuckerman uh, tonight. Uh, but what's... Uh, been uh, studied from these uh, sources is in fact uh, how many names there were and what was the most frequent sort of name. And what you find is basically the names you get for individuals within the Gospels and the Book of Acts also fit with the names that you would have outside the Gospels for um, uh, Jewish males and females of the land. So if I can give you a bit of statistics on that. Outside the Gospels, you find that the most popular name for a Palestinian Jewish male was Simon. Inside the Gospels, it's also the most popular name. Second most popular name, Joseph. Outside the Gospels, also the second most popular inside the Gospels. And then what we find is if we take about the, the top two men's names outside the Gospels, we find that they're about 15, 16%. Inside the Gospels, about 40%. Let's go to a bigger data sample. Top nine men's names, you find about 41% outside the Gospels, about 40 inside the Gospels. In other words, a pretty good correlation. Uh, fewer statistics for women's names and therefore a slightly more variation the, uh, and a little bit less imagination about what names to use, I have to say. But there we can say that the top woman's name outside the Gospels was Mary, inside the Gospels also Mary. And that uh, we have about 39% uh, um, of women inside the Gospels with uh, the top two women's names, Mary and Salome, uh, outside the Gospels about 29%. About half of women outside the Gospels have the top nine names, about 61% inside the uh, four Gospels. Now these are patterns which are showing up across four different writers writing five different books. It's quite striking because I think if I asked you to write a story about people in Libya a hundred years ago, you would rather struggle to give, uh, and you had lots of characters in the story, you'd struggle to give them all the right sort of names. In fact, even if you were to write about lots of characters in California right now, you might struggle to get their names in the right proportion. These proportions of names have only been known for the last 20 years or less, and we find that the gospel writers basically fit within those proportions. We can look at the most popular uh, Jewish men's names in Israel. We can go across to the many Jews that there were in Alexandria in Egypt, and we can find a different pattern of names. So does anyone know of you know anyone called Sabbatius? Why not? Because the Gospels weren't written about Jewish men in Egypt. If they were, it would probably become a popular name like Dosithius, Papas, and Ptolemaeus. Um, but you can see that there's a different pattern of names in that place. Now, if people were just using their intuitions to give people the right names, they probably wouldn't. Now, what we find is there's a little bit more going on, because what happens when you have very common names like Simon, you call out Simon and lots of people might turn their head. So you need to do what Wikipedia calls disambiguation. Disambiguation means that that side of the room liked that. <laughs> but anyway. Um, Disambiguation is, of course, the fact that you have, Jesus has 12 disciples, two of whom are called Simon. One is Simon called Peter, the other is Simon called the Zealot. So you add something extra to them. And that's happening with all the most common names uh, in the Gospels. Uh, happens with the Mary, Mary Magdalene, you, I'm sure many of you have heard of. Mary, the mother of James and Joseph. So you get that sort of disambiguation happening with the more common names and not with the less common names, which fits really with stories originating in the time and place. And of course, we have to add to this the fact that we find names very hard to remember. Uh, I find names very hard to remember. I shouldn't be saying you all find names hard to remember. I'm sure some of you find names hard to remember. Is that right? Uh, at least some of you. Because usually there's, well, almost always, there's no logical connection between someone and a name. They're completely arbitrary things, aren't they? And, and that means that often there are times that we can uh, look at someone, we know all sorts of things about them, where they come from, what skateboard they use, and whatever it is we know about them, uh, and yet we can't remember that vital piece of information we need for the introduction. Uh, 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 um, anyway, <laughs> do I really have to use that label in my first sentence talking to you? Um, so there is that feature, which is very striking in the Gospels, that they've got this detail, which is really quite a hard detail to get right, stories are far easier to get right. So I think if they got that sort of detail right, then having a good enough memory to get the stories right is not very hard. You can contrast it with some of the uh, apocryphal Gospels that people sometimes talk about on the media. 
the sort of names that they might give you. Uh, Gospel of Thomas, Gospel of Mary, which doesn't even tell you which Mary it is, or the Gospel of Judas, they don't do so well. The Gospel of Judas is one of my favorites. It's got two Palestinian Jewish um, uh, names. Uh, really, one of them is Jesus, and the other one is Judas, and then it has lots of figures from outer space. So, basically, uh, it doesn't do that well. We find that this also features in um, uh, spoken narrative. So you go into Matthew's Gospel, and you will find that because John is a very common name, when you have a figure like John the Baptist, a character in the narrative can't just say, hey, John's coming down the street. Because the question would be, which John are we talking about? So the character in the narrative, in this uh, particular quotation, a man called Herod, king, um, he calls John the Baptist, John the Baptist, but the narrator in the next two occurrences calls him John. Then uh, Herodias' daughter wants the head of John the Baptist. She can't just say, give me the head of John. She might have got the head of the wrong John. So she asks for the head of John the Baptist, and then the narrator continues talking about John. So we see that the way narrators speak and the way characters in the narrative speak is different. In fact, this occurs for the name Jesus. I think I found this out three years ago. No one had noticed it, that basically when you have Jesus inside speech marks in a crowd setting, it always has a disambiguation in the Gospels. Now, the, f the interesting thing about that is, of course, after Christianity has been going for a little while, Jesus becomes pretty famous. So you wouldn't need to disambiguate anymore. So the fact that you have that feature really is because uh, you have... Uh, the Gospels written early on. By the way, if you miss any of this, I'm sure you'll be able to look uh, online, and this lecture is online if you miss any of the jokes. Um, <coughs> <laughs> Let's look at the test of geography. Um, we find in uh, the four Gospels a number of different towns mentioned, sometimes quite obscure towns. How would someone know about those if they live outside the land? We can also compare it with um, some of our favorite apocryphal Gospels, and we find that they're not very good on towns. I like the Gospel of Philip. That's where the um, media likes to get the bit about Jesus and Mary Magdalene from, you know, and a bit of a relationship there. Um, not that that's quite what that text says. It only knows two towns. One is Jerusalem, which is the capital. The other is Nazareth, which it thinks is Jesus' middle name. So in terms of um, knowledge of geography, not very impressive. Uh, a couple more apocryphal Gospels only managed to get to Jerusalem, and the next 13 that I looked at have zero towns. Uh, so in terms of knowledge of towns, uh, not doing so well. Now, we have lots of other features in the Gospels which I think are significant. One of them would be the whole criterion of embarrassment. I mean, the Gospels have loads of embarrassing things. You find that the leaders of the early church, the people who had supposedly followed Jesus, abandon him just before he dies. I mean, even the idea of crucifixion is pretty embarrassing. All sorts of things that um, aren't very good PR. And the sorts of things Jesus says, that you should do what the Pharisees say, the way he is portrayed as, as getting angry, and so on. We have all sorts of hard reporting, disciples arguing with each other, and so on. These are sorts of things that I think uh, indicate a level of trustworthiness. Another feature of the Gospels we could look at in more detail, but we don't have time, would be the Jewishness of the Gospels. You see, if Christianity began in the cradle of Judaism, then the earlier stage is the most Jewish stage. What happens is fairly rapidly, as non-Jews, Gentiles, become Christians, you get a gentilification which, uh, of, the, of Christianity. In other words, not that it's becoming more genteel and British, but the point is it, it, that, that, that actually it becomes more Gentile and, and uh, forgets some of its Jewish roots. Now, if the Gospels were written at a later stage, I wouldn't expect them to uh, be as Jewish as they are. Another feature we could look at with the Gospels is the fact that we are dealing with authors that can be traced to a particular period. Some people say it's commonly said that the four Gospels are anonymous, which is something that I would like to dispute. The fact that they don't use the names of the authors within the text doesn't mean they don't have it, so to speak, on the title page. When we go to our earliest manuscripts, um, I like this one, by the way. This is um, uh, a manuscript now in Rome, but it's got the um, end of Luke's Gospel and the beginning of John's Gospel, a hundred years before Constantine. So the idea of uh, Constantine, a Roman emperor, like choosing the four Gospels out of a great panoply of Gospels, uh, uh, exercising power, just doesn't really work when, if you went to Ireland, you could find a copy of the four Gospels from a hundred years before uh, Constantine. It, it really just doesn't work. And we can home in, and now we can read the opening of uh, John's Gospel, and you can actually see John's name at the top. 
There are credentials for a gospel, like John's gospel. You can make an argument. It really is written by John. There's someone from around uh, the time of this manuscript who actually quotes a bit of this gospel and says it was, taught, uh, it was actually written by John, uh, and he was a disciple of a disciple of John. Now, you might say, well, how do I know that's a reliable indication of authorship? When you compare that with the knowledge we have, uh, or the reasons we have to believe that, say, Plato authored a lot of his works, it's far more impressive. Because often, the only reason we think Plato, well, not the only reason, but part of the reason we think Plato wrote particular works was the fact we have some manuscripts which have Plato at the, at the top of the particular work, and we match them with ancient references saying that Plato wrote such a work, we put the two things together, we find a consistency of style, and we say Plato wrote it. That's actually less impressive than what you'd have with the Gospels. Now, you could be skeptical about the Gospels, that's absolutely fine, but let's just be consistent. If you're going to be skeptical about the Gospels, be skeptical about all sorts of other things as well. Now, I will, uh, I've been asked to speak a little bit more personally about what convinces me, and, and there are so many things for me which convinced me of the truth of Christianity. But I have to be honest to you that I have gone through periods of doubt in the truthfulness of Christianity in my own life, and we, we can talk about that if you like. But for me, uh, at my current understanding, I have multiple reasons, multiple grounds that I think convince me that Christianity is true. Um, and so I'd need to go over all of those, but that would keep you too long and from the uh, refreshments over there. Uh, so <clears throat> I just want to talk uh, a little bit about the resurrection uh, as an argument that can be used for the truthfulness of Christianity. And I would like to make a three-legged argument. Um, one uh, element of that is the empty tomb. I think we can make strong arguments that the tomb of Jesus on the Sunday after he was crucified on the Friday really was empty. Now that on its own is not a very impressive argument because of course there are, it's possible to remove bodies from tombs. That's, that's perfectly uh, feasible. Uh, has even been done. Um, but, but the point is that that can go together with some other arguments. And the other arguments we could put are the number of people who claim to have seen Jesus risen from the dead. Now, it seems that there were hundreds of people who claimed to see Jesus risen from the dead. A letter write, uh, like uh, Paul's letter to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, uh, claims that 500 people had seen Jesus risen from the dead, and the majority are still alive at the time when Paul is writing about the year 55, so maybe 25 years after the event. What would convince so many people that Jesus was risen from the dead? They must have seen something, or there was an awful lot of people inside this plot, but the more people you get inside the plot, the harder it is to keep it secret. So getting rid of a body could be done by a small group, but that wouldn't explain why so many people claim to have seen Jesus risen from the dead and not just sighted him at the distance. The claims that you get in the Gospels are that people actually met with him uh, close at hand. They had conversations that went, you know, A, B, A, you know, back and forth with Jesus and so on. They even ate with him. So I would want to say uh, that those uh, encounters are different from the sort of encounters people often say uh, claim to have in spiritual vision. People might say, uh, but what about mass hallucination? Well, I mean, I hope you guys don't do drugs. But I mean, <clears throat> but you know, if you have a group of people sitting around doing hallucinogenic drugs, do they all like have the same, you know, vision? Do they, do they all imagine the same thing? I don't think so. So it doesn't really explain. Mass hallucination doesn't exist in that way. But the other element of an argument for the resurrection, and I'm obviously putting this very brief, is everything else we know about Jesus independently. <laughs> you like that? You just like the point. That's was, that was good. I, I wasn't intended to be a joke, but hey, um, fine. Um, what I mean by this is... <clears throat> With Jesus, it's not just that you've got an empty tomb and you've got lots of people having claimed to have seen him risen from the dead, which are two uh, pretty unusual things to get in a combination that really look uh, like something's happened. But actually, you have a whole load of other things that are independently uh, held about Jesus. I mean, he, arguably, he was already famous before these things happened. Uh, that's what most historians, when they look at the Gospels, believe. Arguably, he was already believed to be the Messiah. Now, that's an interesting thing, because in history, there haven't been that many people who have been believed to be uh, the Jewish Messiah. I don't know the exact number. There have been a certain number. There have been other ones. But that's, that was something that was already believed by some um, uh, before um, uh, he died. And that's a rather striking thing. It's unlikely to be made up afterwards, because after all, uh, dying is a sign of uh, failure, particularly being crucified. And... 
it does seem that he presents himself as the Christ. So, in terms of someone who is uh, believed by some to be uh, the great uh, saviour of the Jewish nation, uh, he was already there. He was already believed to have performed miracles. Whether he performed them or not, there is a belief that he performed miracles. Skeptics like Celsus in the second century didn't deny that Jesus performed miracles. They simply discussed what power he might have performed them by. He also happened, very conveniently, of all the days that you're you know, going to die, and there's some different evidence about the exact uh, time of Jesus' crucifixion. I happen to think it was April the 3rd, AD 33. But the point is, uh, there, are, there are different uh, strands of evidence but it does seem that Jesus died on the eve of Passover, which does happen to be the greatest festival of the Jewish nation in terms of bringing together lots of symbolism of, um, of a Passover lamb and a sacrifice and a great deliverer. Uh, that would be a very convenient time if you're going to plan it. In addition, we have the fact that this person does get attributed some rather remarkable teaching. I don't read Chinese. I just like the font. Um, uh, but... Um, <clears throat> Uh, but the, the point is that there are various remarkable uh, sayings that people have, sometimes known as the golden rule. Confucius came up with one that goes something like, what you do not want yourself, do not force onto others. That's, I, I understand it's more literal rendering, and some of you uh, will, will know that. Rabbi Hillel uh, came up with, that which is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow. That's the whole law. But Jesus is said to have said, whatever you wish uh, that others would do for you, you do also for them. This is the law and the prophets. Now, the striking thing for me is that Jesus is the one who's said to have come up with the best, what we normally agree with, the best form of this amazing ethic. Now, he might not have come up with it. It might have been a disciple who attributed to it, it to him. But that's also a pretty lucky thing, to have such kind disciples to come up with amazing things and then say that you said them. I mean, that would be just the sort of disciple it'd be really nice to have. So what, what I mean is you have a, and of course there are other stories that are attributed to Jesus. Stories of, you know, the Good Samaritan and, uh, and the Prodigal Son. Very, very powerful stories. So either he came up with it or he happened to have really generous disciples who are happy to pass on the copyright to Jesus. Whichever way, it's another convenient thing in relation to Jesus. So some people say the problem with the resurrection is it basically spoils science because science has everything orderly, and then you say there's this thing that like disturbs the order. And I say, well, what if I allow Jesus to be a new organizing principle? In other words, it's not that he sort of comes in and messes up order. Actually, he creates order. So my understanding is that um, if you think of Jesus and you are uh, prepared to accept him as the savior of the world and as... Uh, 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 believe the statements that he seems to have made about himself in terms of his great mission uh, in uh, rescuing people and representing God here on earth, if you accept that, then actually other things begin to fall into place. So those are things I have to leave with you, and I believe it's over to Professor Zuckerman. Is that right? Or is that... Or no? Back, back to our chair. Sorry. Okay. Uh, but I'm back to that chair. Okay. <laughs> First of all, on behalf of everyone here, let me thank you, Peter, for a uh, excellent uh, discussion. You and I have lots of discussions all the time, but it's fun to share it with everyone here. Uh, as I understand it, I'm supposed to be the uh, uh, facilitator of questions, but I was also told that I was allowed at least one question of my own. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to pose one, Peter. One of the things that uh, was uh, made prominent in the title of this uh, talk was whether the story of Jesus is either a hoax or history. Mm -hmm. And I think you've done a really good job of refuting the concept that it's a hoax. Mm -hmm. But the issue of history is another more sensitive issue that I'd like to explore with you. Uh, the bit, the the gospel writers don't call what they do writing history. They call it, in English, gospel. In Greek, kerygma. Kerygma means proclamation, a public proclamation, the news. Mm 
I would probably put it this way, news you can use. But the news isn't necessarily history. I don't know about you folks, but ever so often I read something in the newspaper and it's something I actually know about. And almost invariably they get it sort of right, but not entirely right. Mm -hmm. And I say, you know, I wish they were a little more careful about this sort of thing. So news is, uh, has a sense of, I don't mean that these people who are writing the news are, 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 are trying to mislead anyone. They're on deadline. They're trying to get things going. Well, you know something? The gospel writers, they were on deadline too. They had this feeling that the uh, things were coming to a conclusion uh, very fast, maybe next Tuesday. And uh, the fact that we're all here still talking about it, I think they would have found a genuine surprise. But uh, be that as it may, God works in mysterious ways. But the uh, uh, question I'd like to pose to you is, granting that the Gospels are not a hoax, and they are news on deadline, to what extent can we be uh, sure of what is the historical material, and I mean history here in the modern sense, mm -hmm. uh, in the Gospels, to what extent, how, how do you as a scholar, mm -hmm. and also as a man of faith, arbitrate between history and Gospel? Thank you, that's a, a great question. The way I look at it is that, and that really is a great question, <laughs> um, the way I look at it is that history as an academic discipline is, a, is not the sort of thing we quite live by. What I mean by that is that uh, in, you know, let's say you go out for a date with someone, romantic date, you're just getting to know them, and they tell you about their life, and you say to them, can you corroborate that? Uh, your relationship isn't going to go very far. This is dating advice, by the way. Um, <laughs> the, 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 po the point is that often in life, we accept things without further corroboration. On the other hand, if we go to the academic discipline of history, it's a very rigorous discipline, and it wants to say, well, we should only accept things when we have corroboration, and sometimes we need more than that. And there's a certain um, uh, inbuilt, I would even say bias, in the discipline of history that says you get stung more if you affirm something that isn't true than if you deny something that is true. So I think of... Uh, uh, G.R. Driver, when he first heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls, at uh, first thought, this is probably not true. You know, it's too good to be true. That didn't really harm his reputation uh, for very long, and he soon accepted that it was true. On the other hand, when there was a, a guy uh, in Britain who uh, was a prominent historian who denied, who, who affirmed that the Hitler diaries were true when they weren't, that just stayed with him for the rest of his, uh, rep uh, for his career. So I do think that I'm not dealing with something... Uh, uh, with the question, can I prove something to be historical by the canons of modern history? I'm more looking at the question, can I trust them? So when you say man of faith, of course, I, uh, uh, faith for me is really about trust and trustworthiness. Trust does go beyond uh, what you're able to prove in the sense that you might trust that a particular um, restaurant's good because you've heard it recommended previously. That's not a proof that it will be good when you actually go there. Uh, but trust is the way we actually live our lives. So I think there's evidence feeding into trust. And so I would say that there are things in the Gospels that I am unable to corroborate further, like that Jesus told the story of the prodigal son. Uh, but I trust that he did, and it seems to me a rational trust. Uh, that's different from saying I can sort of prove that historically. Does that make sense? Makes sense to me. Uh, sometimes I, I think uh, the difference between a historian and someone uh, who is a, is a person of faith, which, by the way, that could be both, mm -hmm. both the people, it says that uh, everyone, and I'm sure many people in this audience, has the right, and many have indeed made a leap of faith. Historian tells you where you were standing before you jumped, mm -hmm. in that sense, anyway. So, in a sense, you, you, you can get your feet on the, on what little solid ground there is. And in the ancient world, there isn't much solid mm -hmm. ground. And then from there, you can go forward. Now, obviously, it's important to uh, leap from uh, a position of stability or as much stability as you can. If you're, otherwise, if you're just leaping into the dark from nothing, you, you, uh, you can't 
really do that terribly uh, with, let's say, with a sense of validity. But I think what you're saying if, is that uh, as a historian, you look at the things that you can, you can reasonably uh, extrapolate from the facts or from the data that we have, and then from there, you can build your faith from that. Is that it? Yes. I, I wouldn't quite use the phrase leap of faith, because that sounds like you're just you know, doing something really quite wild. And of course, the word faith has been reanalyzed in the last couple of hundred years, so that now faith tends to mean a sort of uh, leap into the dark, whereas I think the word, you know, fides in Latin, trust, does have an evidential basis. So we trust certain brands, we trust certain people. So I, I'd want to say it, it's continuing uh, beyond evidence. I'd also want to say that in, in some senses, everyone trusts things. Uh, uh, we're, we're doing it all the time. It's actually the way we live our lives. So you can't actually live a life without trust. And so the, the, the only question I would have if I'm comparing a Christian trust with another trust is, um, uh, am I actually being less rational in my trust than they are someone else's being in the way they trust? I have a couple of questions here, and I'm going to, and of course, you're all encouraged to participate. This is the first question I have. We have heard criticism from some scholars, notably Elaine Pagels, that Christians have, have ignored non-biblical gospels. This view has been popularized in Dan Brown's The Da Vinci Code. I have to stop here and say, I know Elaine Pagels. Elaine Pagels is a friend of mine. Dan Brown is no Elaine Pagels. What's, anyway, but I digress. What's your, what's your take on these texts, and are they a good means of studying Jesus' life? Um, the way a lot of been been talking in the last few years about apocryphal Gospels, just a bit of history. In 1945, 13 um, ancient books were found in Egypt from around the 4th century, and some of these contain uh, apocryphal Gospels or, or books with the title Gospel of so-and-so, Gospel of Thomas, Gospel of Philip, and so on. And these and a few other discoveries have become um, uh, quite popular. My study of those works, and my um, even better friend Simon Gathercole's study of these works, and he's a scholar in Cambridge, suggests that a lot of the time these works actually depend on the four Gospels. So, for instance, they never choose the names Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, because I think those names were already taken. Uh, they... Um, the, the little uh, historical information uh, that they have can uh, sometimes be extrapolated from the four Gospels. I've already shown you a little bit about their lack of geographical knowledge, uh, lack of um, knowledge of um, uh, the geography of Palestine. Uh, they tend to be very un-Jewish, very disconnected with the Old Testament Hebrew Bible, which when you look at the four Gospels, they're very uh, connected that way. So I would see them as basically a later development. Once Christianity has become really much more Gentile, these sorts of Gospels become possible. I wonder uh, if you, I, I'm just curious, I, I'm going to supplement the question, uh, if you would make an exception of the Gospel of Thomas. Because uh, the Gospel of Thomas, some have argued, mm -hmm. is an early source, and some have even argued that it's a source that was used by the uh, four canonical Gospels. Yes, and that, that's been particularly popular in, in North America. Again, my friend Simon Gathercon has just come up with um, uh, his second book on the Gospel of Thomas, and he's making some really revolutionary arguments, uh, basically arguing that all of the features that people had said were early, such as um, bits of Aramaic language, um, uh, which would be a sign of uh, early language of Jesus, uh, basically don't stack up. So I... I uh, I would certainly think that the Gospel of Thomas, I, I don't make an exception for it. I, th I think it's a second century work. Okay, good. Uh, all right, second question I've got here. The Bible is full of contradictions, mm -hmm. is a phrase that gets thrown around a lot. Mm -hmm. How do you understand biblical contradictions as a scholar, and how do you understand them as a professing Christian? Thank you. Um, the way I, I see things is, of course, a contradiction is not necessarily a bad thing. The way Dickens begins The Tale of Two Cities, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, at which point you might close the book, but you might struggle on for a few more pages. Um, <laughs> uh, 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 but but, the, but the, point, the point is that um, simply using um, uh, code which um, is opposite, saying, for instance, someone asked me a question, do you believe this? And I say yes and no. Of course, my yes is a qualified yes, and my no is a qualified no, but I've, I've packaged them as a formal contradiction. Now, sometimes Bible writers will actually use contradictions uh, quite deliberately. 
John's Gospel has its famous passage, For God So Loved the World. John's Epistle has a, a, a passage which says, Do not love the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father isn't in him. In other words, telling you not to love the world. But of course, you have to think a little bit further about what it means by world and what it means by love. And John's Gospel is actually full of these sorts of things, where it it's, uh, says... Uh, the son didn't come into the world to judge it, and in another place it will say, for judgment I came into the world. And they're in the same gospel, sitting alongside each other. You can find uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 15, uh, where it will say uh, that uh, God doesn't, uh, doesn't, is, is, does not change his mind, and he's not like a man to change his mind, and yet he does change his mind. And it's all there in the same passage. You could find in 2 Kings 17, um, the, a passage where it talks about they worship God and they didn't worship God and they did worship God. So in other words, you've got A, B, A in both of those two Old Testament passages that I uh, mentioned, where you have a statement uh, contradicting the two statements either side, and I think these are things deliberately put in by the authors. Now there, I think, one of the things that makes us use contradiction less often is that since Aristotle and the um, tendency to use technical vocabulary is we like to use one term with one sense and we don't like the idea of using one term with multi multiple senses. That means that um, ancient authors weren't constrained in that same way. Now people might be prepared to accept when they read John's Gospel that John actually has an overall intention when he uses these contradictions. In other words he's making you think a little bit further. What happens though when they find one uh, thing in one writer and another thing in another writer, they always say, well, there's no way I can fit those together. Now, the way I would understand things is that things are written in the Bible such that there are different authors at a human level, but a, um, uh, a single author at the divine level. I can't prove that, but it seems to me a rational thing. And so I don't find the sort of contradictions in the Bible which are... Um, utterly irreconcilable at any level. In other words, I don't find in, in the Bible something that says Jesus was born in Egypt and Jesus was born in uh, Judea. Those sorts of things that would be very hard to imagine, uh, you know, sort of ambulance service, you'd need to sort of fulfill that. Uh, a couple of things like that would be quite difficult. So what I don't find are those sorts of things. Um, so so I, I come to the text uh, believing that um, it speaks truth. I don't think it has to speak truth according to our conventions, our interest in precision. Uh, it can quote in completely different ways than us because, after all, speech marks were only invented in the last you know, few centuries and so on. So there are all sorts of conventions which make it different. Um, but I think... Uh, and, and this is where we'd need to have a very long discussion on, on, on this issue, that I think there is an overall coherence within uh, Bible writers, even that come from some pretty different perspectives. Happy with tension? Me too. Uh, one of the, I, I, again, let me bounce back from that question. Of course. Uh, uh, we, it seems to me, as a modern society, uh, do, we just don't like contradiction. To us, when we see a contradiction, we tend to assume invalidity. In other words, if, it isn't, if there's a contradiction, maybe one is true or the other is, is false, or, but maybe they're both false, but they can't both be true. Uh, what's interesting to me as I read, well, I read more of the Hebrew Bible than I read the New Testament, but I read them both, is that they just don't seem so worked up about this. You know, you can read uh, Genesis 1, and it seems to give you a, one scenario, and you read Genesis 2, and it seems to give you another scenario, and we get very upset about this, but they don't seem to mind at all. Mm. You know, you don't say, don't worry, you know, let me, let me work this out for you. And I would suggest that there's a different hierarchy that they are uh, applying rather than logical consistency, and that is sacredness. Mm -hmm. In other words, if as a, you diligently uh, examine within, uh, let's say, Genesis, as the example I used, and you find that there's more than one tradition, and these traditions are held by your community for whatever reason to be sacred, who are you as arbiter of the tradition to say this one is not right or this one is, this one is right, or let me work this out for you? It wasn't worked out for you because if it were worked out for you, it wouldn't be. These things are sacred. They tend to be 
untouchable. I would even take the extreme. Let's suppose that you used, if there was a gospel, it doesn't, but let's say there was a gospel that said Jesus was born in, in, in Judea, and another one says, and you read somewhere else that said Jesus was born in Egypt. You, I'm not sure I would be as troubled as you, because I would say, well, why did they do that? Because somebody thought, mm -hmm. you know, it, this was true and someone thought that was true. Who are they to say, I'm going to choose A over B? Mm -hmm. They respect the sacredness of the situation, and that doesn't, in my opinion, mm -hmm. preclude what you already said previously, that be, whether one gets all the facts mm -hmm. all in, in like ducks in a row mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily invalidate the overall message. I, a, am I... Uh, Am I putting words in your mouth that you wouldn't like to say? Well, no, I, I think you're putting words in your mouth, which are very uh, great <laughs> and, and mellifluous. Um, um, but uh, I, I, would have, say. I would have a somewhat different perspective in the sense that I would be troubled if you had texts which had uh, those sort of different claims. Because my understanding as, as I, I read these texts is they are uh, seeking to make historical uh, claims even about Jesus being born in Bethlehem uh, and, and so on. Um, I, I do accept that there is such a thing as, as reporting and you can uh, report two traditions. But I think when, we, uh, when scholars claim that they found uh, these two very different strands which have been combined by some editor at some stage, that is essentially a scholarly reconstruction. All we have is the final text. Right. And the final text is what, where we start from and then we try and explain how the final text arose as it did. So if we have uh, two passages alongside each other that seem to us to be different, well, someone put them together and thought that they could fit together. Uh, and so I want to uh, understand that someone's mind. And I think a lot of very intelligent people can waste a lot of effort dealing with hypothetical sources. And I'm not sure that's a very fruitful thing. And that's why I like your work, because you actually deal with uh, extant um, uh, things, tablets and so on, and take photos of them, and they're real. Well, I, I you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a little like, uh, nobody in this audience will remember it, but uh, Jack Webb in Dragnet, he said, just the facts, ma'am. Just tell me the facts. I, I like, uh, I agree, I like to have something I can read, and if it's not easy to read, how can you interpret it? So that's, uh, but that's why uh, I tend to uh, like hard evidence as opposed to what we can do with the evidence. I let my colleagues do more of that, and I just say, here's what you can read. Anyway, let me give you another question. Here's another uh, question from, uh, that was handed to me. It says, uh, w this person would like to, to jump from ve the very Jewish story of Jesus to the emergence of Christianity. Do you think Jesus intended for his followers to become a new religious sect? Did Paul take the story of Jesus in a new direction? I think um, that was his question. Yeah, I, I think that Jesus did have um, some radical intentions. I mean, even choosing twelve disciples is quite a significant thing numerically in terms of there being twelve tribes of Israel, and in terms of the position uh, that um, um, it's attributed. You know, he's talking about them judging the twelve tribes of Israel and, and so on. If he understood himself to be the Messiah, then he intended to lead um, God's people. Uh, and that, uh, of course, might intend a, a break uh, with uh, people who didn't accept his leadership. So I do think um, th what's, what's happened, of course, subsequently, is that Christianity has become non-Judaism. It's forgotten its Jewish roots, uh, and um, uh, Christians have uh, adopted some rather negative attitudes towards uh, the um, way things all began. When you mention Paul, I mean, what's so interesting about Paul is the image that he uses for what's going on in Christianity, where he talks about there being this olive plant, which is Judaism, and how there are parts of that um, um, uh, plant which uh, have been grafted on, and those are Gentiles being fitted onto that plant. But there's basically only one plant, and you've got to remember that the roots are from that olive plant. Um, so, in other words, that every Gentile needs to remember their indebtedness to um, the uh, Jewish origins of what they're coming from, and they uh, need to recognize the um, immense privilege uh, of a position that, that the Jewish people had in being given um, the law and so on. So, that's the way Paul would see things, um, and 
one of the things that uh, has been uh, done is to look at the way Paul wrote his letters and actually often to find a lot of going back to the teaching of Jesus within Paul. So I think the idea that Paul just takes everything off in a completely different direction uh, is something uh, I don't think entirely valid. Let me, let me uh, try a, a, a kind of a sharp question, then I'll turn it over. It, uh, oh, I, I got more. Good. Uh, it's an interesting thing to me that, Ju uh, that Christianity as, we, as a movement moved pretty fast, I mean, out of its Jewish roots and into a non-Jewish context. And I've often wondered why. Why did Jews do that? And I, I'm going to propose a hypothetical for you mm -hmm. and see what you think. If a Jew was told, guess what, the Messiah has come. He said, great, take me to him, because they had a certain expectation of what a Messiah should be. And they said, well, I really can't do that. You see, he was here, but he's no longer here. He, uh, it, fortunately for you, he died for us. And the Jew would say, wait a minute. I don't need anyone to die for me. I need someone to live for me and make those Romans die. You know, uh, so excuse me, Mr. Christian, how am I better off than I was yesterday? Mm -hmm. Because your, your Messiah came, but, you know, it would have been nice of him to stick around or at least come back pretty fast. And uh, uh, I wonder if the sort of the, that plus the, the, the Jewish maybe suspicion that the uh, proliferation of the one God into more than one as a Jew might look at that. They might have looked at that as a covert appeal to old-fashioned religion, and I mean non-Jewish religion, otherwise known as polytheism. Mm -hmm. um, well, are you suggesting that might be a way whereby the resurrection could come into Christianity? Well, in, I, I'm, just, I'm just saying Jesus that alive, a, a no. Jew would say, great, he, 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 came, he came back from, but what's, 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 what good has he done for me lately? Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, that's why I, I wonder. I mean, clearly in the Gospels, you have the expectation that people have that a Messiah is going to be a, someone who's going to politically rescue people from the Romans. And that's, that's often presented. You know, Luke 23 would be a famous passage where lots of people, Jesus is on the cross, and lots of people are calling out to him to save. They say, save yourself, save us, you know, and so on. That's, that's, that's the real expectation that someone on the cross is actually being shown to be a loser. And so, uh, you know, what, what good is it? The, the way I, I would see it is, I mean, what's so striking is that anything managed to get off the ground with <laughs> a hero who had been shown to be a public loser, which is what crucifixion does, and then with a resurrection, which um, Jews would be unlikely to accept because you might believe the resurrection is for all people at the end of time or God's people at the end of time, but one out of sequence with the rest is really a bit weird. Um, so that's strange, and for the Romans, they would think that, um, you know, wouldn't it be better to go to the realm of thought or mind after you died rather than come back in a sort of gross re-embodiment? So um, how on earth did something with that at the center of it get off the ground? To me, the best explanation is, if a resurrection really did happen, that would be so shocking, surprising, and motivating if you actually met someone like that, that it would explain how it got off the ground. Now, I realize that's a non-historical explanation in the sense that it's, um, a historian would say, well, you can't have miracle stuff. So, uh, But it does seem to me that it does explain it in a way that other things don't. A young lady over there has been very patient waiting for us to uh, give her a chance. So let me give you a chance to talk. Thank you. 
again, just remembering uh, what his history is a discipline. I mean, how can you prove divinity using history? It seems to me, let's remember there are only two areas in academic discipline that actually can use proof. One is mathematics and the other is formal logic. Um, and th those can do that because they are a set, uh, uh, very artificial situations, almost like games, where you set up rules and you can therefore make a conclusion. Other things don't use proof in that sort of way. So um, what I want to say is uh, reasons for divinity. Of course, at one level, uh, Jesus has lots of reasons not to be divine. I mean, the very fact that you, uh, people could see a person standing in front of them would uh, seem evidence that this isn't God. Uh, and the very fact that this person died on a cross would be very good evidence this isn't God, in many people's eyes. Uh, so there are lots of things counting against any sort of deification, as well as the mathematical problem I, I alluded to. What I do think we can show historically is that there were early on people who treated him with some of the attributes of God. In other words, if you go to the, some of the letters in the New Testament, which were written between 20 and 30 years after the beginnings of Christianity, they treat him as the judge, which was normally something only God could do. They treat him as creator. They worship him. They sometimes pray to him. In other words, lots of things that were very exclusively within Judaism, something you only do to God, Christians are doing within just a few decades to Jesus. You then look at somewhere like uh, Pliny, where he describes a meeting uh, of, of Christians as recounted to him by people who've given up the faith three uh, or many or even as much as 20 years before his time, which gives you really a first century Christian meeting, and they're, they're singing to Christ uh, as to a God. So I think these things together uh, give you a remarkably quick acceptance of Jesus being God, which doesn't fit a lot of the parallels that people want to adduce to Jesus being God. But that would be my perspective on things, uh, and I'm sure Professor Zuckerman uh, has a different one. No, no, I don't. I don't I, I, I'm very happy to uh, let, uh, you know, let the, the audience speak, and I don't, want to, I don't want to overdo my role of this. Let me, uh, I've been asked to uh, work this out, to do one card and then one person, so you're on deck. But first, let me, this is a good question anyway. Given that the Bible is predominantly written from the male perspective, mm -hmm. why should I, a woman, this is the person who writes, value it? Mm -hmm. What role do women have in the Bible other than to be objectified? Fantastic. Um, one of the interesting things, of course, about the Bible is far more male names than uh, female names, probably authors predominantly, possibly entirely male. But when you look at the Gospels, and you look at the portrayal of people, it seems that the males don't come off quite as well as the females. I mean, who are the loyal people who follow Jesus and go to the tomb? Uh, it's the women. What are the guys doing? They're having this ego debate about who's the greatest. Um, so that's an interesting perspective. And then you read through the narrative, and you realize that there are some really very remarkable roles played by women. So, you, you know, you've got this guy called Moses, and his mother hides him and, uh, you know, supposedly puts him on, on the river in a basket. Uh, sister's looking after him. And, you know, there comes Pharaoh's daughter and adopts him. And, and these really pivotal roles that are, are played to such an extent that you could say um, nothing could have happened without what the woman was doing. So a really classic and one of the sort of most sordid tales uh, in the Bible is Genesis chapter 38. Now Genesis chapter 38 is where um, there is this guy called Judah uh, who you're sort of expecting to have um, uh, the, the king uh, and um, uh, you know d descended from him at least if you read the later bits of the Bible that's what you're expecting. Uh, and uh, what happens is uh, he has a son and the son's no good, you know, God gets rid of him. He has another son, uh, and he's no good, so God gets rid of him. And he has one more son, and, um, you know, what's happening with him? Uh, not a lot. Uh, and then, uh, you know, he, 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 he's too young. And, and these two first sons had, had married a woman who's an, a non-Jew called Tamar. Now, the interesting thing is Tamar gets rather fed up of waiting for her husband. So she takes everything into her, her own hand. And she decides she's going to dress up as a prostitute, and along comes uh, her father-in-law, 
and uh, father-in-law is uh, ever so indecent about all these things and uh, gets together with her and so on, and they produce offspring. But the point about this story for me, um, which people have criticized from a moral point of view, but the very interesting thing for me is how this is the line that leads to King David, that leads to all of the kings of Israel, and the whole thing depends on what that woman did. If she didn't do that, none of it would have happened. So in other words, in terms of causal links, um, you, you can't write out the really significant role uh, that women played. So the, the understanding, I think, that's behind the question is, of course, um, in a secular perspective, um, men and women are understood as equal, which is fine. But in some secular perspectives, of course, men and women are understood as equal, but essentially as, as just chemicals. I mean, the value of a human is simply uh, that of, of a machine, and, you know, it dies out. Now, I'd want to maintain that, of course, Christianity, in all of the different denominations, uh, whatever the role of women they have in those uh, denominations, has a far higher view of women than that sort of secularist construct. So when you're given a choice between that, for instance, and Christianity, it would have seemed to me that Christianity has a higher view. Now, you might still struggle with, 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 uh, w uh, with the Bible, but I, I do think, uh, you know, one of the most remarkable, um, you know, characters in the Bible is the character of Mary. There are other uh, very significant things. And, um, you know, the women are not coming in for the same critique. So there is an asymmetry um, that's there, and uh, I, I don't think that can ever be taken away. I, I just might point out there is uh, one female figure in the Hebrew Bible who uh, proclaims that before God did anything else, before he made oh, anything, heaven and earth, he made me. Mm -hmm. And that is th the personification of wisdom. Wisdom in the Bible is female. In other words, as usual, how could God do anything without a woman? And there is a, a subtext through a lot of the Bible and even pre-biblical things that men may have a lot of the bluster, but from Eve on down, women had the brains. Anyway. Uh, thank you very much. Is it on? I can't tell. It is? Okay, good. Um, thank you very much for your talk. It's been very interesting so far. Put it, either talk louder or... Uh, closer. Or closer. It, how about that? It's not on? It is on, in fact. It's just apparently pretty weak. Okay, just... What if I get really close to it? That's great. That? There you go. Okay, there we go. Just so, want to make um, sure everybody hears you. Yeah, it's on. I just... It's just really weak, apparently. Sure, let's try that. Hold it. No. Now it's good? All right. There yeah, all right. So uh, thanks very much. Um, my question, I guess, is a little bit twofold. Um, firstly, I'm wondering to what extent you can separate Christianity from its Jewish origins. Mm -hmm. And if it can't really be separated, then I was hoping you could comment on the quite remarkable connection between the Hebrew Bible and the material that predated it, primarily all the Sumerian and Mesopotamian literature and where you personally draw the line between understanding a Mesopotamian story and legitimate biblical narrative. Thank you. Um, one of the things about the, um, the question, uh, which is where I'm sure that Bruce and I are not at all on the same page, um, <laughs> is, uh, is the whole question of the age of the material within the biblical narrative. Now, let's just give a little bit of history uh, on this. We now have the Dead Sea Scrolls, which gives us bits of the Bible as far back as around the year 200 BC. Um, Dr. Zuckerman has made the best images of, uh, in the world of the very earliest uh, bits there are of any part of the Bible, which are around the 6th century uh, BC, and they're tiny silver amulets, which he can give you uh, an amazing view of uh, containing a bit of the Book of Numbers. What is often said is that when we compare the Mesopotamian material, um, the uh, creation stories and uh, flood narrative and so on, well, of course, they are far, far older because they're in second millennium uh, copies and so on. 
And what we have in the Bible seems to come from much later. Now, I'd want to challenge that perspective, and I'd do it this way. If we go to a Bible that's 250 years old in America, and we look at the dates that they have in the margins for different Assyrian kings, you will find basically that they get the correct dates for the Assyrian kings to within two or three years at a time before Assyrian has been deciphered. There are five Assyrian kings mentioned in the Old Testament in the correct chronological order, uh, such that you can look at various Bibles. It will tell you Tiglath-Pileser um, died in 728. We now think it was 727, and, and so on. That's because there has been uh, remarkably valid historical material passed down within the Bible. Um, and the point about that is, if you had a Bible that's 250 years old, where has it got it from? It's got it from uh, a text edition of the Bible, which was based on manuscripts no earlier than the 11th century AD. But those text editions have given you reliable information from 1,800 years prior to their time. So what I'd want to say is one of the things I do not like going on in uh, uh, um, some areas of scholarship is putting maximum ages on biblical material based on the fact that we haven't found copies of the Bible earlier. Um, if I understand it correctly, most of the ancient uh, Israelite writing was done on perishable material, leather and papyrus, which perishes. Of course, on the back of you get, sometimes get... Um, seal impressions which show you fiber marks where there were fibers. But I don't want to put a maximum age on some of the stories in the Bible. So when someone says the Mesopotamian Babylonian stories are necessarily older, that's a presupposition that I would like to be open to challenging. Uh, that is, I don't want to put a maximum age on material in the Bible. There's some material in the Bible that really suits an early time. So the famous story of Joseph getting sold for 20 pieces of silver, you can actually tr um, uh, plot the price of humans and selling humans over a pretty long period of time. There's lots of economic documents for that. And that story, that price, really fits with a very n nice early second millennium date. Now that's where I'm probably way off from where uh, Dr. Zuckerman is. Um, but I have to declare that um, different starting point in looking at the material. Um, that means that the question doesn't quite work for me. <laughs> First of all, Peter's right. I don't, dis I don't agree with him on this one. Uh, in particular, I, I think it's important to understand that when the biblical writers were writing, they weren't writing in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. There was a culture, there was a tradition that they both were very familiar with, and just as importantly, they didn't always like it. Mm -hmm. So, for example, uh, a famous example is uh, the flood story, which we could trace back, oh, at least to the third millennium BC, which is a long time, almost to the origins of writing, or origins of literature. And for all I know, it was floating around in uh, oral <laughs> form before that. But one of the major points in that story is the gods decide to destroy humanity because they're overpopulating and they're, they're making too much noise and it's for a frivolous and stupid reason and in fact they almost uh, kill their own meal, meal ticket by doing this. Now what's interesting is the Bible clearly knows of the story. They even cite part of it but what do they say after the flood story is concluded and, Mo and Noah comes out of the uh, ark God gives commandments to Noah and one of the first commandments he gives is be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Now, why do you think that's there? It's because he wants to say, the, the narrator, narrator wants you to understand that that story, that old story that we all have heard or, or at least are familiar with, that's just wrong. God would never do that. God would never be so frivolous mm -hmm. as to kill people because they're messing up with this beauty sleep, you know, that, which is what the Mesopotamian story says. And so... In that story, the story to some degree, uh, it may well be quite ancient, but it is an ancient story that is to some no small degree trying to redefine the nature of God. So you don't think God would be like that. And in that respect, the story uh, is reacting to what I would take to be an older story, mm -hmm. but is very definitely wanting to set the record straight. Say, don't, don't accept that story. I know you know it, but don't accept it. 
And uh, so there's a lot of that going on in the Bible where you have some of these older stories and the Bible goes out of its way both to embrace some of the issues but also to deny them. Well, we're going to have some great discussions tonight, obviously, uh, uh, about this. All right, uh, well, I, I don't want to, again, I, you know, he put, it's like waving a red flag in front of a bull when he said, Professor Zuckerman will not agree with this. Well, he's right, so. Anyway, <laughs> let, let, here's another good question, then I'll come back to you. You said you had doubts about your faith. Mm -hmm. What incited these doubts? Mm -hmm. Do you still have these doubts? Mm -hmm. Let's start with the end bit. Um, do I still have doubts? Yes. I think it's quite human to doubt, um, as in we tend to fluctuate. And, and I mean, you know, believing some of the things about what will happen in the future, I mean, it always seems, you know, like not, very, not as real as the present, you know. Uh, but so I, I do doubt, but I don't doubt, I think, in the way that I did doubt. What made me doubt, I think, was to, uh, a number of things. One is um, coming across arguments that I couldn't answer, and that um, made me conclude, I think, sometimes falsely, that there was no answer. Um, uh, sometimes I think it was because I had wrongly construed uh, beliefs already, so um, there, you know, my beliefs needed modification, um, and my understanding of what Christianity entailed. Um, uh, needed some further, you know, uh, qualification. So, in you have a particular expectation about the 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 text of the, of the Bible, and you you find that that's uh, not your uh, what you learn. Uh, then, in in fact, that can lead you to a bit of of time of thinking things through. But what I have found is that uh, Christianity works for me intellectually in the areas I know the most about. Uh, it also seems to work in the areas I know a little bit less about and uh, right the way through. So in that sense, I feel that it is extremely intellectually satisfying and actually has led to me making some academic discoveries. So that is a bit of a, 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 you know, a positive test for me. Hello, my name is Sam Adams. Um, First of all, I'd like to start off by saying my question will not be nearly as intellectual as yours or anyone else's, but um, I'm going to go anyway. So uh, in one of my classes this semester, we were talking about the idea of history and um, how it's one of those things that we're all raised to believe. It's like third grade, you know, you learn George Washington's the first president. You don't raise your hand and say, no, teacher, wrong, you know. It's just something that um, you trust. But we, we're looking at articles where it's talking about like history books from the late 1880s all the way through now. Um, history, like the cause, for, for instance, let me give a quick example of the Mexican-American Amer Mexican War in the 1880s was, you know, one thing. This person started it. By the, like, 2013, the cause is completely different. And so at the end of the class, I found myself wondering, if, I, if, we, if we can't even trust the history books, how, what's the difference between tr trusting the history of the Bible? How are we supposed to distinguish what history we can believe? Because clearly history is created by people and we're imperfect beings. So how do we know that what we are creating is true? Thank you. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> Thank you. I, th I think the issue of knowing that something is true, uh, sometimes uh, what, what you're looking for is a sort of certain um, knowledge. Uh, and you can have different levels of certainty about different things. But whatever happens, I am sure you will have narratives about the past. So secularists have narratives about the past. You know, the big narrative that religion's been causing violence for a long time and grouping lots of things together. Or there's a common narrative that people used to believe the Earth was flat and then Christopher Columbus found it wasn't, which is, of course, completely wrong. So there are lots of um, narratives that people have of the past. Um, and uh, people are going to believe them because uh, those sort of stories uh, shape our interpretation of data today. That is, um, we don't think that we're just experiencing a random set of events. We actually group events and try and interpret them in the light of um, our experiences and our beliefs about history. That means that history as an academic discipline is an absolutely essential one. Because if you can tell the history, basically you shape the whole mindset of, of, of a culture. Uh, and so that's where it's extremely important. Now, what I'd say with, with the Bible history is that I'm not trying to claim that I can prove it by the canons of history. I'm trying to say that I can uh, show 
uh, and I've been particularly focusing on the Gospels tonight, show uh, signs of trustworthiness. And those are the sorts of signs of trustworthiness which are of the less intellectual kind. They're actually the sort of interpersonal uh, trustworthiness. We find this all the time. We meet people and sometimes we don't trust them uh, and sometimes we do trust them and we actually build our lives that way. And I would have thought that uh, when someone reads uh, some of the things they find in the Bible, they m- might find lots of signs of trustworthiness. Just to give you uh, one from the Book of Kings as opposed to some ancient writings. There's a, uh, um, a Phoenician king called Kilamua, I think in the ninth century, who says, you know, everyone before me has done really badly and I've been really great. Sometimes pharaohs put up monuments like that. I photographed his inscription. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I probably used your photo. Um, <laughs> probably did. It, it, but what, what you find is, is that you compare that with what you have in the Bible when it tells you about the kings. And it, the one thing we know about the Bible in the book of Kings is clearly it's not commissioned as royal propaganda because those kings come off pretty bad. Uh, and that, it, do you know any national literature which says as much negative about the people group from which it originates as the um, Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible does about the Jewish people, do you know any religious founding documents which say as much negative about the people who founded the religion as the Gospels? I don't. So in other words, I think you've got some pretty remarkable features uh, there which a lot of us would read and think that seems to me a sign of trustworthiness. Okay, I've got a question here about law. Can you talk about Old Testament law? What role do they, what roles do the laws have? Should we obey them and expect others to obey them? Uh, Right, so um, there is a group of people, I think they're called theonomists, who try to apply, these are uh, Christians, who try to apply Old Testament law uh, today in in a a fairly uh, strict way. But uh, the vast majority of Christians through the ages have not understood Uh, that to be what they should be doing. For for one thing, because Christianity isn't about setting up an earthly kingdom, the kingdom of heaven that Christianity talks about is not a political system. Um, So that's uh, one difference when we look at the way the New Testament treats the Old Testament law. It can treat it in various ways as teaching you lessons, uh, but in terms of instituting politically, um, uh, be pretty careful. Um, Not that one can't, I mean, One can't say that the Old Testament law is very good. I mean, a lot of the time people look at these laws and they say, well, that's really mean. You know, why do they have those sorts of commands and and, and so on? I I think the Old Testament law doesn't do that bad. Uh, What I mean is you can't, unless you have an economic surplus, you can't have prisons, right? I mean, prisons require an economic surplus. So for us to look back at a society and criticize the way they have punishments because they're a subsistent society doesn't seem to me a very fair thing. So uh, when we look at how often do our, does our legal system deliver justice, how often when you go to the courts do we feel justice is done, real fairness, uh, we might not be very satisfied. Well, at least in the Old Testament law, if you brought a, ca- a case um, falsely, any um, punishment you are going to have inflicted on someone else gets inflicted on you, which seems to me reasonably fair. <laughs> I, I, I might add, I mean, there, there are a lot of laws in the, in the Bible uh, that uh, are uh, hard to swallow. <laughs> and when I wrestle with these issues, I remember that the Bible endorses change. Mm-hmm. The quintessential example is we've got this thing called the New Testament. Mm-hmm. When it, who needed a New Testament if the, if the Old Testament was fixed and, and, uh, uh, and not to be messed with? The, but the, in, within the Old Testament too, I mean, uh, there's, uh, uh, you can read certain parts of Isaiah that uh, talk about uh, things happening one way, and then you get to about chapter 40, and there's a, a new message. Say, by the way, in light of current events, we are re- readjusting. And the Bible uh, is constantly readjusting in the light of current events. Uh, if you follow Jewish and Christian interpretation, especially in the early periods, they kept, kept you know, even if the canon got closed, they kept on interpreting, and of course people still do today. But to say that the Bible from a legal standpoint is it and that uh, you can't 
change a, a dot or a tittle mm -hmm. flies in the face of what the Bible itself tells you you should do. And so I would say that, well, I wouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater, you know, say, all right, therefore all the laws go away. I mean, obviously, if you're a Jew or a Christian, you have great respect for the legal tradition that the Bible has. But the tradition does change over time. And the, and, and the Bible does endorse the right of people to make interpretations. That's what Jews and Christians have been doing for the last 2,000 years. Would you? Yeah, let's leave it All there. Right. <laughs> All right. All right. Let's, we'll do you, and then I have one more question, and that's going to, I've been told uh, that's, that's, my, that's my allotment here, so go ahead. Uh -huh. mm, okay. Hi. Um, I always wondered about what you labeled as the embarrassment that's contained in the Gospels. And um, this might seem like a silly question, but how would you respond if someone asks you, what if the Gospel writers included those embarrassing and negative details simply because they knew without such details, people would see their stories as too good to be true and like a fairy tale? What if they included the details just for credibility? Mm -hmm. that, I mean, that's a perfectly fine explanation. Um, I think the, the problem is, you know, people have different ways of trying to explain the Gospels, and two very common popular ways are to explain the Gospel writers being very, very clever and doing this sort of thing. And the other one is they get everything wrong through bungling incompetence. I actually go for a pretty middle course of neither making the Gospel writers particularly clever nor particularly stupid, just, you know, fairly ordinary. Um, uh, there is a sort of complex psychology uh, to that explanation, which I think makes it a less natural um, explanation. But of course, on, on its own, it's perfectly fine. But they still you've got to add in all of the different aspects of an argument, which might include what's the level of knowledge they have. I think I can show that the, the gospel writers know some of the layout of the temple, they know a lot of the customs, they know a lot of details. And the time when the gospels originated would have been a time when there would have been a lot of respect for the particular Christian leaders like people like Peter. So all four gospels have Peter denying Jesus thrice, which is really quite, you know, a strong thing to do. Um, and I would have thought in, in that situation, making up an event like that, attributing it to a particular person who is also said to be the number one leader in the early church, would be quite a bold thing to do if he hadn't done it. Um, and probably not the sort of thing the leader himself would come up with. So it just becomes a little bit implausible for me, but it's not impossible. Okay, I have one, one more question. I, and I'm, I'm, I, I looked through the stack and I said, this is the best one I have, have left. No offense to the other, the other questions. <laughs> and it's really simple. Peter, do you believe there are errors in the Bible? Well, I obviously believe that taking the fruit was a big error, uh, <laughs> uh, you know. Um, um, and I'm glad you didn't say apple. <laughs> um, I, th I think uh, in Bible translations there can be mistranslations and these, all these sorts of things. But I would believe, and this would be controversial, but I believe that um, the scripture... The word Bible is just a hundred, a thousand years old, and scriptures are slightly older uh, word that I like to use for this particular purpose. The writings are all authored by humans. They're all also all authored by God, and therefore share the characteristic of God of His truthfulness. Uh, and I would want to maintain that uh, throughout the whole. Now, of course, that invites um, you know all sorts of people to come and. Um, say, what about this, what about this, what about this, and, and you can do that. Uh, I'm not saying God speaks truth in a simple way, but I do think that it is true in the whole, yes. Well, thank you. <laughs> well, fun. For more information about the Veritas Forum, including additional recordings and a calendar of upcoming events, please visit our website at veritas.org.